This is standard level content from C4.2 on transfers of energy and matter. We'll take a deeper dive into energy flow through trophic levels. We'll be talking a lot about trophic levels in this uh, video. And so trophic levels are going to depend on where an organism is in the food chain. Food chains will always start off with a primary producer and primary producers are eaten by primary consumers. Primary consumers are eaten by secondary consumers. So in this example here, and I get this from this part of this food web, the fox is a secondary consumer. However, if I consider a different feeding interaction in this food web, the fox is not a secondary consumer. In this case, the grain is eaten by the grasshopper, which is eaten by the bird. So the bird is the secondary consumer and the fox eats the bird and is therefore a tertiary consumer. So a fox can be both a secondary consumer and a tertiary consumer depending on what it is eating. And all of these classifications that we're seeing down here are called trophic levels. You may hear some other references, call them things like first level consumer, second level consumer, third level consumer, that's also okay. We can actually visually show the amount of energy moving through different parts of our food chain by constructing a diagram called an energy pyramid. Now, energy pyramids show the amount of energy gained per year per unit of area at each trophic level. And this is a big no-no, don't do this. Don't draw your energy pyramid like this because this is not proportional. It doesn't actually show something that represents the amount of energy that moves on. And that's because only 10% of the energy is going to move between one trophic level and the next. So it needs to be a stepped or scaled model, not triangular. We're gonna label it with the trophic level, the energy value, and the units. And I think it'll be easier if we just hop right in and I can show you how it's done. So we'll start off with our base of our food chain here, okay? And this base of the food chain is always going to be the primary producers, okay? So I'm going to label this with my trophic level. And this is telling me here that primary producers in this ecosystem have 30,000, some weird unit. Okay, rule of units is you need to use them even if you don't know what they mean. I'll teach you what this means, but I'm gonna write it first and then we'll talk about it. Now, okay, this actually means per unit of area per year. So Kj is kilojoules, that's a measure of energy. And then this m to the negative two exponent, that means per meter squared. So meter squared goes on the bottom. So kilojoules per meter squared per year. So that's what that means. It's the amount of energy produced per meter squared every year. Doesn't matter if you forget what it means, just write it. Okay, so my primary producers, only 10% of that energy is going to move on to the next level. So if I take this down by a factor of 10, now I'm not at 30,000 kilojoules per meter squared per year. I'm at 3,000 kilojoules per meter squared ah, per year. Okay, so I can write it like this. And since it's gone down by a factor of 10, we want to make sure that our next level is only 10% as large as our primary producers. You don't have to get a ruler out or anything. We just wanna use a step diagram to show that that is happening. So between the primary producers and the primary consumers, we have a 10%, only 10% moves on. So a 90% reduction. I can't fit this word primary consumers in here, so I'm just gonna write it next to it. All right, and then I'm gonna draw one more here, one more level, one more step, okay? And that's going to be for my secondary consumer. Now, these secondary consumers um, could very well get eaten, that's totally possible, and you could have to draw a uh, energy pyramid that shows an, another layer. I'm just not going to do that now. What I want to show you here is that this 30,000, or sorry, 3,000 that belongs to the primary consumers 
goes down again um, by 90%. So now I'm only left with 300 kilojoules per meter squared per year. Okay, and so this is a way of drawing my energy pyramid with all the things I need. I've labeled my trophic levels, the energy value, and the units, and it is stepped and scaled according to the 10% rule, or at least as good as I can do it. So if only 10% of the energy is moving on to each trophic level, where is the rest of the 90% going? At each trophic level, I'm losing 90% of my energy. Where is all of that energy going? Well, a few different places. First, before we get to that, it's important to understand that this massive energy loss is what limits the number of trophic levels I can have in a food chain. Typical food chains don't have more than three or four levels. It's possible it could have more, but it very much limits the amount um, of organisms or biomass that we can sustain up here because of this massive energy loss. What are the reasons for this 90% energy loss? A few, one of which is cell respiration. So when organisms are doing cell respiration, yes, we're converting that carbon compound into ATP, but there's also a massive amount of heat loss there. So heat is generated by cell respiration. Warm-blooded animals can utilize that heat, but in general, it's not a usable form of heat. Now, or sorry, not a usable form of energy. When I say usable, you can't use it for locomotion and you can't use it to make your own carbon compounds. So at each level, there are actually fewer and fewer carbon compounds available because many of those carbon compounds have been oxidized and that energy has been lost as heat. There's also incomplete consumption. I know then when I eat food, I don't always eat the whole organism. If I'm eating a banana, I don't eat the peel. If I'm eating meat, I don't eat the bone. So incomplete consumption results in an energy loss between two levels. And the same goes for incomplete digestion. Even if I eat an entire organism, I might not have the enzymes to be able to fully digest that. So if I eat a hamburger and that hamburger has lettuce on it, I actually don't have the enzyme necessary to digest that lettuce. And so part of what I'm eating isn't being turned into biomass. It's not being turned into usable energy from my body. That is being lost, okay, in between these trophic levels. So here's, again, the formula for cell respiration. And just to clarify, the goal of cell respiration is to take the chemical energy that is contained in glucose and convert that into chemical energy in the bonds of ATP. But we're really quite inefficient and bad at that. And this process also produces quite a bit of heat energy. So not all of this energy that's in glucose gets converted into ATP. A lot of it is lost as heat. You and I can use that heat for some things, right? We can maintain our body temperature, but again, what we cannot do is convert that heat back into chemical energy or use it in a, a way that helps us to build biomass. So therefore it cannot be passed on to the next trophic level. So I wanna repeat that. Even though you might use heat as a, something nice and usable, if you were to get eaten by another organism, that heat doesn't get passed on to that trophic level. And that's why we say that it is lost. It's also the reason why we need a constant energy flow in order to sustain our ecosystems. Sunlight is coming in, plants are using that to make carbon compounds, okay? We're eating those carbon compounds, but then we're taking most of that energy and it's escaping. So that's why we need this constant energy supply from the sun, or if you're a chemoautotroph from chemical reactions. So again, this energy loss is going to really limit our food chains. Now, food chains can vary in length. We looked at a food chain that only has three organisms and then a different food chain that has four. So there is some variation there, but it would be very strange to find a food chain that had 12 steps in it. 
there's just so much energy loss between each step that there's not enough energy. There's not enough energy containing carbon compounds at that 12th level to sustain any kind of population. So this energy loss is going to limit two things. It limits the number of trophic levels. Four is a very typical number. Again, we're not going to see something really crazy like 10 or 12 but it also limits the amount of biomass. So if I consider this carrot rabbit fox um, feeding relationship here, I need a huge amount of biomass of carrots in order to sustain this rabbit population. So this rabbit population in terms of total biomass is going to be much less than the biomass of carrots. It's only gonna be about 10% at the most. That also means that I'm going to have relatively little biomass of foxes. So this is going to be very much like the energy pyramid, where if I'm looking at biomass, I need a lot of biomass of carrots just to sustain some biomass of rabbits. And that biomass of rabbits is only going to be able to sustain a small biomass of foxes. Notice that I'm using the word biomass and not population. So it's not individual organisms, it's the mass of organisms at each trophic level that you can support. And again, that's limited by that energy loss. Although the pattern of these biomass pyramids or energy pyramids is fixed, the actual size of them is not. So let's say that throughout the year, these carrots either reproduce to make more carrots or the carrot plants themselves grow, that can actually extend their biomass. So that can increase their biomass if they grow and reproduce. The same thing can happen with any of these other trophic levels. So as you have a greater production of biomass in your primary producers, that's going to allow you to have more biomass in terms of your primary consumers. Either the rabbits themselves are growing bigger or they're able to make and survive, like new baby rabbits are able to survive um, because they have enough carrots to eat, something like that. So we want to keep an eye on growth and reproduction as things that lead to increases in biomass. That accumulation of carbon compounds in heterotrophs or consumers is called primary production. Okay, so primary production. Now we can talk about this in two different ways. One of which is the GPP or gross primary production. I like to think of this as being like a total. This is the total biomass of carbon compounds that are made during photosynthesis. If we want to talk about how heterotrophs are going to increase their biomass, we first need to talk about the producers. The producers form the base of every food chain. Now, producers, we can talk about how much they're producing um, in terms of either gross or net. Gross primary production, or GPP, is the total amount of biomass, those are those carbon compounds, made during photosynthesis. So all of the glucose, all the starch, all of the lipids that organisms are making during photosynthesis. The net primary production, or NPP, is going to be smaller because it's the GPP minus what those plants are using for their own cell respiration. So in terms of what is available to heterotrophs, it's really this NPP that is more important. Okay, so again, the NPP, this is what is available to consumers. And by consumers, we're talking about heterotrophs here because it's what the plants are making during photosynthesis minus what the plants themselves use. So whatever the plants themselves aren't using is what the consumers have available to them to eat. And then whatever they eat can uh, be used to accumulate their own biomass. We can actually look at NPP, net primary production, in different biomes of the world. So you can see that there's a really high NPP in these equatorial regions, okay? Not so much in deserts or Arctic regions. The units for NPP are grams of carbon per meter squared 
per year. And so it's really interesting to see how that uh, changes with different climates. Again, theme C is all about interaction and interdependence. We need to understand that heterotrophs are going to be dependent on the primary producers, not only what they're able to produce because of their environment, but also how much they're using for their own respiration. Now, secondary production has to do with biomass of heterotrophs. And when we look at the biomass of heterotrophs, again, it follows a similar pattern to the energy level. So biomass at each level is going to decline. So there are fewer carbon compounds that can be oxidized. Um, so you're gonna have less biomass per area as you go up through these levels. So if we think about this as humans, if um, we eat something like beef, so the human would be here, the cow would be here, and the grass would be here. We need a lot of producers and a lot of cows in order just to sustain a little bit of biomass if that's what we eat we can actually increase our productivity by eating more plant-based diets. So if humans become primary consumers instead, now let's take a look at that. For the same amount of plants, okay, I can um, maintain a lot more biomass of humans, okay? So it's one of the things that we should consider when we're taking a look at sustainability and how our own choices in our diet um, affect this movement of carbon compounds through ecosystems.